Hello, it's Scott Matley here. 50 years ago, Apollo 13 was in the final stages of preparing for what would be an ill-fated trip to the moon. But by this point, the flaw in the oxygen tank that would explode had literally been baked into the system just over a week earlier. Today, I want to explain exactly what went on to turn oxygen tank number two into the ticking time bomb that crippled the mission. The oxygen supply was critical to the mission. Not only do astronauts need it to breathe, but it fed the fuel cells, which were the primary power source for the command module. And the water that resulted from the chemical reaction in those fuel cells was itself an important resource to keep electronics cooled and to supply drinking water for the crew. This importance meant redundancy in the design. There were three fuel cells, two oxygen tanks, and two hydrogen tanks, all mounted in Sector 4 of the service module. The oxygen tanks were designed and built by Beach Aircraft Corporation, and they weren't just simple containers, they were self-contained units which included insulation, sensors, and propellant management hardware. The oxygen tanks were 66 centimeter diameter Inconel spheres, which would carry 148 kilograms of liquid oxygen. There were two concentric spheres with a layer of fiberglass between them, and the space would be evacuated to insulate the tanks. The tanks were strong because they had to operate at very high pressures. The high pressures would keep the oxygen in a supercritical state, which solved a lot of problems with managing fluids in zero G. A supercritical state is where there's no transition from liquid to gas. There's no surface that forms, no bubbles or droplets. Compare this to regular liquid oxygen seen floating around in zero G after this rocket reaches orbit. Supercritical fluids are good because it means that you get consistent fluid flow out of those tanks when you drain them, and it makes it easier to measure how much oxygen was in the tank. The downside is that supercritical fluids need very high pressures. In oxygen, it needs pressures of about 50 atmospheres to achieve this. As the oxygen was consumed, the pressure would drop, and so, to keep the pressure up, the tanks contained electrical heaters. And to be clear, the temperature inside the tank would still be cryogenic, even with the heaters running. The heaters ran along the length of the tank in parallel to the capacitance sensors used to measure the tank fill. There were concerns that without gravity, there would be no convection in the tanks, and the warmed oxygen would slowly mix around the tank. This would mean that the fill sensor would only show lower values than in reality. So to ensure the warmed oxygen could be efficiently mixed, there were a pair of fans which could be turned on to stir the tanks and ensure a good, reliable reading of the fill sensor. All of the wiring had to run inside the tank and it used Teflon insulation because Teflon is pretty inert and doesn't burn in air. Teflon is a marketing name. The technical name is polytetrafluoroethene. It's a polymer where all the hydrogen atoms have been replaced with fluorine. It's inert because the fluorine is a stronger oxidizing agent than oxygen, so it doesn't generally react with oxygen. Generally. Finally, at the top of the tank, there were all the plumbing connections to fill, drain, and vent the tank. Originally, the tank in question was installed in Service Module 106, which would ultimately fly on Apollo 10. But around this same time, changes were being implemented in the design, so the decision was made to remove the tank and replace it with an updated one. The tanks were paired up and installed on a triangular shelf for installation in the Service Module, so the entire shelf is what they would remove. And the removal didn't go according to plan. While they were trying to lift it out, a bolt was missed, which secured the shelf to the service module. This in turn put too much stress on the support rig, leading to it breaking and the shelf dropping. Now, lots of sources talk about this and how this tank was dropped two inches, damaging it and causing all the problems. But it's not so simple. I mean, it never is. The entire shelf didn't just drop. The support rig failed. It broke in the middles and forced the uh, shelf upwards. Oxygen tank number two hit the shelf above and then it dropped back down. And while it couldn't be proven, the Apollo 13 investigation panel believed that the impact may have damaged the fill connection inside the tank. 
But again, that in itself didn't make the tank dangerous. So the shelf was removed, upgrades were made, tests were performed, and the shelf was then installed in Service Module 109, which would then be shipped to Kennedy Space Center in June of 1969. And in March 1970, it was going through the final preparations for launch. During the countdown demonstration testing, the tanks were filled to 100% with liquid oxygen, and then later the testing required emptying them down to 50%. This was done by blowing pressurized oxygen into the tank and then opening the fill line, which would drain from the bottom of the tank out the top. So the gaseous oxygen at the top of the tank pushed the liquid down and it flowed up the fill line. Tank 1 drained correctly, but tank 2 only drained down to 92%. They repeated the process a few times, but no more liquid would drain out of the tank. This was probably because the connector at the top of the tank had been knocked loose, and the gas at the top of the tank was flowing out the pipe instead. The ground engineers chose a different method then to raise, uh, drain the tank. They would use the heater to boil off the liquid oxygen and vent it as a gas. The heaters for the ground test were much more powerful than they would be in flight because they were fed 65 volts electricity rather than the 28 volts that would be used in flight. The requirement to handle the higher voltage levels had been a change from the original specification, but the engineers at Beach had verified that all the hardware in the tank could handle these higher voltages. At least, they thought they had. The heater included thermostats, which would cut the power to the heaters if it went above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or about 27 Celsius. The switches were originally spec for 28 volts, and they had been tested to show that they could carry 65 volts just fine, but somehow the switching action had never been verified at 65 volts, and it turned out that the higher voltages weld the switches closed. So at one point during the ground testing, the tank had been left with the heater energized for eight hours. And without the thermostats working, the temperature reached probably over 500 Celsius, well above the point where we start to worry about Teflon breaking down. The wire insulation was very likely damaged during this testing, but there wasn't any outward evidence of this. The problems with emptying the tanks were discussed amongst the engineers. It was estimated that it would take two days to replace the oxygen shelf, then more to redo the testing, and this whole procedure also came with the risk of damaging something else. The problems with emptying the tank on the ground wouldn't have an impact on the flight performance in zero-g, so the decision was taken to proceed with the tank. And so Apollo 13 proceeded with its launch, and 56 hours into the mission, just before scheduled sleep time, mission control requested the oxygen tanks be stirred to help assess another unrelated problem. It wasn't the first time they'd run the fans, but this time something shorted out. The damaged insulation allowed a spark to jump across and generate enough energy to start a fire in the damaged Teflon insulation. Now, if you've seen the movie Apollo 13, you might think that flicking that switch was like triggering the detonator, detonator in a bong. 13, we've got one more item for you when you get a chance. We'd like it to uh, stir up your cryo tanks. In addition, uh, I have a shaft and trunnion. Okay. Or look at the Comet Bennett if you need it. Okay. Stand by. Okay, here, oh, yeah. we've had a problem here. But in reality, it was more than a minute between Jack Swigger flicking that switch and the explosion. As I said, Teflon doesn't burn in air, but at 50 plus atmospheres of pure oxygen, it can sustain combustion. Under those conditions, it can burn into carbonyl fluoride or carbon dioxide and carbon tetrafluoride. Now, none of these are hugely energetic reactions, and when NASA performed tests afterwards, they estimated that it would burn along the insulation at a rate of a few millimeters per second. So inside the tank, the insulation on those wires would burn like slow burning fuses. The combustion products and the thermal energy released by this raised the pressure in the tank slowly over the next minute or so. 
There was a pressure relief valve that probably triggered, but it was not able to relieve the pressure as quickly as the combustion was raising it. The Teflon wasn't the only material in the tank either that could burn under these conditions. There were aluminium components which would burn with a lot more energy if they were ignited. But the slow pressure rise in the tank suggested that only the Teflon insulation was burning at first. So over the next minute, the fire burned up the wires to where they crossed into the tank, and they likely burned through at this interface, quickly filling the void between the layers and until the pressure blew out a rupture disc at about five atmospheres of pressure, letting the pressurized oxygen blow into sector four of the service module. From there, there's actually evidence that the oxygen that vented raised the pressure and temperature enough to allow the mylar and kapton insulation in the service module to burn for a short time until the pressure was high enough to blow out the side panel into space. That panel likely knocked the antenna out of alignment, which was the first things that the teams in mission control would notice. This was also the bang that was heard and felt by the crew, marking their you know, notice that there was a problem. And from there, the real fight for survival in Apollo 13 began. A fight which we are thankful was won through the combined efforts of the crew and mission control. Afterwards, when the events were analysed, there were redesigns made for the tanks to prevent these problems. The Teflon insulation around the wiring was replaced with magnesium oxide, with a stainless steel sheath added to avoid stop the wires moving. The fans were deleted completely because by the time Apollo 13 had flown, they'd collected enough data on the flight behaviour of the tanks to know that the effects of the stratification in the tanks were small enough that they could ignore it. They also added a new emergency battery and on the other side of the spacecraft a third oxygen tank and extra water to be used in an emergency. And so the Apollo program continued and lived happily ever after, until it was cancelled. But that's another story. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.